Now, one thing that's happened for me these past two weeks is I've been doing this 30 Days of Taker video series is I, I've been flooded with this stream of nostalgia and memories. Like, you don't realize just how deep. Like, 30 years is a lot. And 30 years sounds like a lot. But when you start to measure it up against your own life, you realize just how long 30 years truly is. Like admittedly, a lot of the people that subscribe to this channel, a lot of the people that will ultimately watch this video may not even be 30 years of age. Like that, That's how deep this career runs for The Undertaker in WWF slash WWE. And it's just the nostalgia of so many things going back to my time as a smaller kid, to a teenager, to a young adult, to a, you know, somewhat grown man, to a more grown man, to a even more grown man, but even more childish, you know, like all of the evolution that has happened over the past three decades. Um, a lot of nostalgia, a lot of wonderful memories have come back. Um, and certainly, one of those feelings of nostalgia that comes back to me is for Paul Bear. Like, Paul Bear is somebody that when I think of The Undertaker, I think of Paul Bear immediately. When I think of Kane, yeah, first, I'll admit, I think of The Undertaker, and second, I think of Paul Bear. And when I think of mankind, one of the first people that I think about is Paul Bearer. And you know, WWE recently released that uh, this documentary about William Moody, Paul Bearer. Um, I can't even remember what it's called at this point, but it's on the network. It's less than an hour. I highly, highly recommend that you watch it. It's short, sweet, to the point. Gives you enough insight into... The progression and growth of his wrestling career from being a young fan and him and Michael P.S. Hayes with Mr. Moody living in Mobile, Alabama and Michael P.S. Hayes being from Pensacola, Florida and how they got started in the wrestling business together and Moody's time as Percy Pringle in professional wrestling, his time as a mortician, his time coming back as Percy Pringle. The very first match that Texas Red, the Undertaker, ever worked, his manager there was Percy Pringle, to how everything kind of came full circle. And just watching how that all played out over the years. And even in that short documentary, like, so many wonderful memories and so many, uh, again, nostalgic feelings, bittersweet in a way, uh, knowing that Paul Bear, William Moody, passed away, I think it was about seven and a half years ago now. Oh, man. Again, time just flies, doesn't it, guys? Um, but, you know, as I've been thinking about it and been thinking about this series, you know, I'm sure I did a tribute video for Paul Bearer all those years ago. I, I, I'm probably pretty sure I did. Um, but one thing I don't ever think that William Moody gets credit for, Percy Pringle, um, Paul Bearer, whatever you want to call him, I don't think he ever gets credit for just how good of a manager he really truly was. Like, people will say, like, yeah, he was great. But when you think of, like, all-time greatest wrestling managers, weirdly, his name never gets brought up. You'll hear, obviously, Bobby the Brain Heenan, the Mouth of the South Jimmy Hart, Jim Cornette. You know, those are usually the three names you most often hear. So I'm going to throw Paul Heyman in, too. Um, so those are some of the names that you hear most often. And what I've never understood, and maybe I just haven't done a good enough job of kind of enunciating this over the years, and that's what I'm here to do today, is I don't get why more people don't think of Paul Bearer as one of the truly all-time greats. And not just like, hey, he's a Hall of Famer and he's great, but like he is truly one of the pillars and bedrocks and examples of all time, all time, all time great wrestling managers. You look at all the people that he managed over the course of his career, even before he became to 
WWF in 1990. Like, even when you just look at the managing of the Rick Rudes of the world and a very young Undertaker and so on and so forth, like, Percy did a lot of good work outside of WWF. So he didn't just have his WWF career. He had several years of being a noteworthy manager, a guy that could actually get some heat. You know, the type of guy you look at and say, damn it all, that's what professional wrestling should be. That's what a professional wrestling manager is. But then you throw in not only the good work that he did before WWF, then you talk about coming to WWF and becoming the manager for The Undertaker. Like you had started him off with Brother Love and the dynamic kind of work. But Paul Bearer, as a manager of The Undertaker, took that character and got a rocket ship strapped up to it and it went straight to the top to where it frankly never came back down from. You know, when you think of Paul Bearer, you think of the uh, old talk show segment, The Funeral Parlor. You think about how he was the yin to the yang or you want to say he was the white to the black or black to the white of The Undertaker, whatever what it was, but do, do we forget just how good this guy really was? The hardest really was Like, people want to make that kind of a parody, but, you know, dude could really talk. And he was a character. He was the perfect type of of character that perfectly accentuated his protege, his disciple in The Undertaker. Like Paul Bear had this great ability, especially at the very, very beginning, to get a lot of heat on himself and found a way to get that to all transfer to the big, dark, mysterious Undertaker. But then, able to make those same type of dynamics work as a babyface and do it incredibly well. And when you think about guys like I'm not here to debate Bobby Heenan being the greatest manager of all time. You know, managing Nick Bockwinkle and so many others back in the AWA days to all that he did with the Heenan family in WWF. You know, Heenan certainly earned that spot. And I mean no disrespect to other guys like Jim Cornette or the Mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart. But damn it, like, Paul Bear deserves to be in that stratosphere especially when it comes to WWF managers, I think he's better than both of them. And you might say, well, he didn't have to manage as many guys as the mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart. You know, maybe he wasn't the same level of talker as Jim Cornette, one of the truly great talkers in the history of professional wrestling business. That's true. But Paul Bear was attached to The Undertaker, and Undertaker took off and became a main event guy, stayed a main event guy, even as character tweaks change and so forth, and pretty much has been a top guy for almost 30 years. In 1996, when they brought in Mankind and he was feuding with Taker, what really truly legitimized and established Mankind and made him a top flight player in that company at that time? Nothing against Mick Foley, tremendous talent, obviously. But it was Paul Bearer. Like, Paul Bear worked. They were able to play off of each other well. It was Paul Bear that brought him legitimacy and credibility. So you could say that's a second main event type of player that Paul Bear as a manager made. And then obviously you go to 1997, and you've got Kane. Like, yeah, maybe Paul Bear in the WWF didn't have 50 hits, but all three of his motherfuckers were grand slams. Like, no joke. Like, you think about that. This dude was able to be a manager for a decade, realistically, close to it. And be in a top kind of featured spot almost the entire time. And always brought something to the table. Always got the best out of his guys. Always made his guys better. And when you think about, like, the whole thing they showed in the documentary from the, of course it was Road Warrior Hawk, it's an old known story that he came up with the name of, I got it, Paul Bearer, get it, Paul Bearer, like, just magic, man. But when you think about WrestleMania 20, I can even go back, think back to when I bought that pay-per-view, there were a couple of reasons I bought it, one of them was, the a big, big reason, was because 
Taker was returning. I knew Dead Man Taker was returning, which also led me to believe, in spite of any reports at the time or anything else, that Paul Bear somehow, some way, was going to be there. Because if you're going to do it, and it's in the garden at WrestleMania, you got to do it big and you got to do it right. And they absolutely did that night. Like, if you really truly think about it, like, why does he not get more love? as top two or three managers in WWF slash E history, top two or three managers in wrestling history. Like his career was long. It was notable. It wasn't just a one trick pony. There were more layers and more elements to it. And he helped make several guys and helped get more out of several guys. Like, I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting caught up in the moment of the nostalgia coming back and watching the Paul Bear documentary that they put out on the network. Um, could be. But maybe it's more of a realization of, man, you know, we really have slept on this dude over the years. And just how really, truly, truly, truly talented he was as a wrestling manager. I don't think anybody disputes just how good and talented he was as a wrestling manager. I think sometimes we just forget how truly, truly good he really was. So you can certainly feel free to leave me some comments, talk about your favorite moments and memories from the life and career of William Moody, a.k.a. Percy, <coughs> excuse me, Percy Pringle, a.k.a. Paul Bear. Let me know what you think some of his best work is, and let me know whether you agree or not. Is he one of the truly all-time greats and does not get the recognition that he deserves? Is he one of the more criminally underrated managers in WWE and wrestling history? Let me know in the comments. Either way, thanks for checking out this video, a continuation of the 30 Days of Taker video series. We're 14 days into it. Tune in again, and I've got more videos coming up, so stay tuned for those. Yeah!